Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Blizzard Watch Podcast. I'm your temporary host, Joe Perez, and joining me today is the wonderful uh, master of all things ceremony and editorial on the site, Liz Harper. How are you doing today, Liz? Hello, I am doing very well. How are you today, Joe? I'm doing well. Uh, we have so much to talk about today. Uh, and for those of you that are tuning in, uh, Matt was a little under the weather today, so we are we are flying without him. Uh, he will be joining us on the next recording, though. Do not worry. Uh, so let's start, though, with the news, because we've got a bunch to cover. Uh, so Turbulent Timeways begins on September 26, which is, as of the time of this recording, today! Uh, which it's is, live! It's live! Uh, which is five weeks of time-walking content to help you gear up and alter just because it's fun. Liz, what's your favorite part about Turbulent Timeways? I, it's just, I think it's fun to go back and uh, revisit all of these things. And... All of them are kind of like, okay, it's always been long enough since this was current that it's, you know, it's a little nostalgia trip without necessarily going all the way back to classic and playing the original game. Uh, but one of the things that confuses me about uh, this, this, uh, this series of time walking, usually when WoW does time walking, and the last time they did Turbulent Timeways, they do the expansions in order. Yes. Uh, now they aren't. The Turbulent Timeways... This week is Cataclysm, next week is Burning Crusade, then Legion, then Mists of Pandaria, and then Wrath of the Lich King. And it's like, well, okay, if that's, if that's how you want to do it, that's how you do it. But it's, it hurts my head just a little tiny bit. Yeah, I'm kind of um, curious why. I'm not mad at it, though, personally, because I think it's yeah. actually, I think it's interesting to mix up the order so that it's not the same every week, every time they do this uh, point. event. Uh, so I think it keeps it a little bit fresh. Um, but I also really like that this is a content that we can do with our guild between tiers, uh, yeah. which makes me really, really, really happy. Um, so I'm all on board for it. <laughs> uh, one thing to remember is, you know, not only are we getting time walking every week, we are getting uh, extra loot or higher eye level loot because uh, completing your five time walking dungeons every week for the Turbulent Timeways event will award you a cash with heroic aberus gear item level to uh, 428 to 437 instead of normal difficulty loot like it usually does when time walking just rolls around so i it's a great way to gear up an alt it's a great way to uh fill in those pieces you've never gotten dropped for your main and uh, it's just it's just fun really Absolutely. Uh, and I just, again, I'm looking forward to it. I look forward to it every time. I actually thought it had already gone live earlier this week until I was reminded <laughs> by the guild that it did not. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it as uh, Liz and I, our guild will be running the, the through it in groups as of tomorrow, which I'm very excited for. Uh, we have new trading posts items coming in October, uh, which were data mined. And one of them is Really, really interesting, which is a candy cane weapon. <laughs> I am so excited. I am going to transmog into this forever. <laughs> you just want to stab people with, with pure sugar is what I'm hearing. Uh, Yeah. I mean, basically, it does look like a one-handed sword model that is like a candy cane that's been sharpened on the end. So, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. I think we need to have a holiday themed raid where everyone has to come with a candy cane except if it's only a one-handed sword candy cane that's a problem we need more ridiculous holiday transmog agreed uh it's not the only new item that is uh that is coming out uh it is filled with such great things uh such as uh the blade masters azure stones which are sort of like those uh, monk style, or like what you would think of as classic monk style or warrior style, gigantic beads that the Blade Masters wore in Warcraft, um, that we see a little bit of here and there throughout the history of World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. So those will be available. You have the. Uh, I, go ahead. I I do want to jump in and say I'm not sure what this is confirmed for. This October. is all data mine stuff. Correct. Yeah. So it may be October, but you know that candy cane. We may be waiting until November, or December. Yep. Uh, which is true for all of these things, right? Uh, yeah, so we yeah. have the the other thing that might be available is the Scarlet Zealot's trappings, which uh, doesn't exactly say what it is, but if it had to hazard a guess, it's, it's probably something so, with the Scarlet Crusade. 
WoW had said that it's encrypted. They only have the name, which is also very interesting. Is this something uh, story-wise we're going to get? Is this some big secret they don't want to uncover? I mean, maybe it's, maybe it it's a, nothing it, that exciting, but I do wonder. I does, wonder. It does have a tenders cost with it. Uh, so it is it's still uh, it's still data mined with it. While it is encrypted, it still has a cost of 550 trading tenders with it. Um, brand new pet, probably for December, which is a... Uh, it's called Mitzi, which is a very tiny, adorable uh, little Mitzen, uh, which is the version of uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer for World of Warcraft. So that's that's there. So cute. So cute. <laughs> very, very, very cute. Uh, also a uh, Trader's Sarong, uh, which is a cosmetic item. Uh, which is sarong is a, a tube of fabric often worn around the waist, which is traditional to uh, Southeast Asia, uh, as well as northern and uh, northern parts of Africa and East Africa, uh, where it's you know it's, it's not a kilt or anything like that. It's it is its own thing, uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, when I'm glad they're they're adding items from otherworldly cultures into it, so that you have more options to dress your your characters. Also, kind of goes with the whole. Uh, Blade Masters Azure Stones because Blade Masters would mm. traditionally wear these uh, instead of like normal, I don't want to say normal pants, but instead of pants, they would wear a sarong uh, instead. And then there's the, the, we already talked about the candied blades. So really interesting things coming there, which also there was a Crimson Glimmer Fur, which is a mount, it looks like, a uh, fox mount, uh, which mm-hmm. we don't know when it's coming out, but probably December because it is. Uh, marked with the description of one of Great Father Winter's favorite creatures. So I assume that's going to come out during that one. I do want to jump in with another thing, not from the trading post, but uh, we have seen uh, another data mining thing for a pet called Arfus, who is, of course, a ghostly dog. And he's been associated with an achievement called the Lick King. Oh, my goodness. uh, How many things are we have to slash lick in game? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say, well, the, the achievement is a feat of strength category for a promotion. So it could be, it could be one of those six month subscription things. Uh, and it sounds like it may be in both classic and retail. Very interesting indeed. It's, it's also really, which is it. I mean, clearly that's all I care about. I mean, if transmog improves DPS, then does having an adorable pet also help you out there? Maybe, maybe. I, I would like to believe so. And if not, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be proven wrong. Uh, speaking of pets, Prime Gaming also has uh, an offer up for us from now. I believe it's up now until October 24th, uh, which is mm-hmm. the Zapau Tiger, which is a uh, almost like an amethyst looking tiger pet that you can go ahead and get yourself. Uh, it is very cute. Add it to your collection. It just takes a couple buttons to click. Uh, it actually reminds me of the mounts that you would yeah. make from jewel crafting in yeah, the Pandaria. I was, I was about to say exactly that. It has that kind of shiny gem like quality to it, which I am absolutely here for. Uh, also, if you are listening to this in advance, you still have a couple days left to grab the Tabard of Brilliance. If you're listening to this after September 28th, I apologize. Uh, it will no longer be available. Uh, if you are playing Diablo 4, the Vermilion Bolt, Thr- Bolt Thrower and Dark Tome Bundle will be available until October 19th. Uh, and also the Owl Guardian Mercy skin for Overwatch 2 will be available until October, 20- uh, October 19th. And a random epic card for Hearthstone until October 18th. It's actually quite a lot of content they've been pushing through Prime Gaming for a lot of their games. I'm very surprised by that, but not not upset at all. Uh, Yeah, they've really got a new partnership going with Amazon where we're seeing something new for pretty much every game every month. So if you are a Prime subscriber, it is really easy to just go and click those and collect your shinies. And I do I do like shinies. I just like them. Yeah, I mean, I I am a serial collector. One of those (laughs) things where like if if you leave it to me, I will go out of my way to just collect things in real life. I'm a magpie in game. I'm a hoarder. (laughs) This is just a thing that happens. Uh, I went to realize this when I went to go check my void storage the other day and realized that I haven't moved anything (laughs) out of it in forever. And I don't need to have anything in there anymore. Like a lot of the stuff I have in there is been like I can transmog into them. But like some of the stuff took me so long to get that I just don't want to physically delete them. Like (laughs) 
Uh, yeah, my bank is my bank is full precisely because there are things that I just cannot delete. I I just have to keep it forever. Fair enough. Um, I don't know if we, this is a question here, and this is one that Matt put in the email, but I actually don't know if the answer is available. Are there any Twitch drops going on right now? Uh, there is. I believe there is one for Overwatch. Uh, that is five Overwatch tier skips. But it's actually, uh, it's one that requires a fair amount of dedication because you get one tier skip for watching two hours of Overwatch. And uh, if you know how Twitch drops work, whenever you have reached the, um, the, the, whenever you've earned a reward, so you watch two hours, you've earned that tier skip, and you can earn up to five of them. Now, but you have to claim the one you earned before you can start making progress on the next one. So it kind of uh, it kind of forces you to pay attention and not just turn on Twitch and leave it running all day. I am upset. So it requires by this. a little, yeah. It requires a little bit of dedication. After two hours, you've got to tune back in and click to claim it, and then two more hours, click to claim it. Five tier skips maximum. So that's ten hours of watching, and every two hours, you've got to go and click to claim your tier skip. I almost kind that of curious is, how much playing the game would give you, like how long it takes to get a tier in game. <laughs> um, you know, I may actually, I, didn't, I know they've recently done a series of updates. I may try to reinstall it again and see if I can ah. do my, my monthly. Can I play this game yet? Uh, the <laughs> dance that I've been doing with overwatch for mm-hmm, overwatch two for mm-hmm. a year at this point, blizzard, please, please yeah. help me. Um, just to kind of see how that goes. Cause I'm actually really curious how rapidly you gain tiers. And if it's, more economical to just play the game uh, or to, you know, refresh your Twitch every two hours to, to claim the, uh, the, the, yeah, the tier skip. That is available to October 2nd. So you have a little bit of time to finish that up. If you want to do it through the weekend, that's probably your prime Twitch viewing opportunity. Awesome. Uh, we have more coming up too, though, as well. Uh, currently, we are in the WoW Harvest Festival season, which is mm-hmm. from now until October 2nd. Uh, so if you need to go and do your uh, myriad of wizard chores, uh, as we call them, uh, <laughs> where you can go and, and get whatever the items are that you may be missing from the Harvest Festival, now is the time to go ahead and do it. As well as the Brewfest is active until October 6th. Uh, I haven't done the Brewfest this year, uh, but I did see an article on the site about, or I, I thought I saw something about the armor being hard to get still. Is that is um, that accurate or... Yes, there is a new dragon riding appearance, which is basically it's for your uh, the proto drake, which I'm forgetting what that one's called. The uh, Vermilion proto drake. Yes, uh, and it's basically you know it's a saddle with a keg behind it. It's got that sort of bl- of uh, brewfest vibe, but uh, you get it from the chest. Corin Dire Brew drops after killing him, and uh, it it feels kind of like. The the X twenty nine heartbreaker twenty nine forty five uh close enough. it feels like the it feels like the love is in the air rocket mount that everyone wants and gets their heart broken trying to get or like every the original year. or like the original brewfest mounts mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it just seems to have a very low drop rate and it's possible though it hasn't been confirmed that you may only be able to get a chance for it on one. K- Per day, so you can't necessarily run all of your alts through there to get more opportunities. That is exactly how the Heartbreaker works now. You get one chance a day, and that's it. Uh, and we don't have much longer for Brewfest. It seems kind of weird that it's this hard, and it's just it's a dragon riding appearance. It's not even a mount you can use all the time. So I wish this was a little bit more common, so everyone could get it and enjoy it for the holiday. Or yeah, this is one of the things, and maybe this is a topic for a day when Matt's here as well, but mm-hmm. I event mounts have always sort of, I don't want to say angered me, but they make me a little upset because if you get them, you feel great, and then you never worry about that event again. But if you don't get yeah. them, you feel bad. And there are people that I know have been trying for certain mounts that they just really love the look of, that they just can't get, like the Love Rocket's a, a good example of it, where they... They never get it, and they keep trying every year, and they continue to never mm-hmm. get it. Uh, you know, and and we all have those items we chase. For Matt, it was his shoulders. Uh, for me, it was the Dragon Stalker Tier Two Hunter gloves that I just <laughs> finally got last year. Finally, mm-hmm. um, everybody's got that stuff that they chase, but it's like maybe they should start looking at 
having the mounts purchasable with currency from the event or some mm-hmm. an alternate way to get them, especially for something like this. Like you pointed out a, a really great thing here or, or a, a great point you have here, which is it's for dragon riding. Yeah. Dragon riding is not everywhere. You can do it in this expansion. And when you get to like uh, the, you know, the kingdom cups, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, uh, you can use them there but nowhere else. Like they're not usable elsewhere in the world. And there's a lot of world where they're just not usable. So yep, yep. at that point, does it make sense to have it be a, a really rare drop? I don't know. I, I, I just think they could do better and make it feel better for people. Uh, speaking. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead. I don't know that the rarity of a reward really makes it, does it make it more fun if it's super rare? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, interesting comments. Uh, let us know if you think uh, yeah. <laughs> if the rarity of amount makes it more fun or not. <laughs> I know my opinion. <laughs> uh, we also have the we mentioned this a little bit too uh, earlier with the Overwatch 2 anniversary uh, still going on right now, which we are in. What week are we in with it? Because there's a it's a I, multi-week event, I, right? Yeah, I think this is the second week of it. I may be wrong on that. It seems it seems crazy that we're already one year into Overwatch 2. I mean, on one hand, it feels like Overwatch 2 has been forever. And on the other hand, this is like the first time they've had an anniversary event. Do I do I have that entirely wrong? Am I completely off base here? No, I don't think you're wrong at all. Like it, it does. It, and I think part of that is because <sighs> Overwatch 2 has sort of like a I don't want to say a checkered history, but I don't know a better way to phrase it. There's a lot of stuff that happened with it with like, you know, Kaplan leaving and leadership of the development of the sequel uh, changing and then the sequel changing from really a true sequel to an expansion of sorts uh, and then getting pushed back and pushed around. Like, so it feels like it's been here, but also feels like it hasn't been that long either. And I think part of that is because of some of the decisions like it is based off of Overwatch one's framework. Uh, yeah. and so it feels like it's always been here because Overwatch one released how long ago at this point? A while, a while. I want to say it be- was what? 2016, 26. Wow. 2016. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. It, time, time flies. Zoom, zoom and right along here. Yeah. Uh, but this is indeed Overwatch two's first anniversary. And, uh, Wow. Wow, one year of Overwatch 2, one year of Overwatch plus Battle Passes, which if you listen to this podcast, you know how much we all love Battle Passes. Yeah. So, which I so guess, much. Uh, let's talk about what the actual like event part is, just so it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, so the week two, if we are in week two, and, and i sorry if we are not, I haven't been able to verify myself, obviously, but week two brings back Assault Maps, which are back in the arcade. Uh, which are the capture defense static points, which was always a fan favorite from Overwatch 1. People really did seem to enjoy those. Um, it's the most challenging map, and it's also very intense because it can lead to very long team fights, uh, which I think mm-hmm. is why people really liked it. Um, they're also bringing back the Catch Amari, which is the elimination uh, confirmed style game mode where you pick up the pack of Mari toys dropped from defeated opponents to score points for your team, uh, which is a lot like... This is going to sound weird. There's a Pokemon MOBA game where <laughs> after you knock out the the opponent, like the opponent Pokemon, they drop like essences that you need to like bring to a collection point. Feels very similar to that and some other MOBA styles. Not a bad thing. It's actually really fun. Uh, and then you can save the galaxy with Star Watch Galactic Rescue, uh, where a team of watchers, attackers, work to liberate three CHO, otherwise known as Echo, uh, from the clutches of the Infinite Empire in a four objective point map. Uh, so a little little Star Wars reference there for a little fun and profit, which I think is actually really, really entertaining. Uh, and then week um, three. Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say this lasts until October 9th. So you only you only have a little more time to do it. And then week three, which is coming up after that, will be the Summer Games and Mischief of Magic, uh, which, well... It's going to be essentially like Lucio Ball, Winston's Beach Volleyball, a bunch of summer game modes, uh, and then a prop hunt style game mode where Knight Genji chases down mischievous rogue Kiriko as she transforms and hides as everyday objects, which prop hunt is a (laughs) very, very popular FPS format, even still. Uh, And it's been out for ages at this point. 
So having it included here makes sense. I think people will have fun with it. Uh, let's see what we have left here. I think we've covered that. Uh, the Diablo 2 ladder, season five, will begin on the 28th of September. Uh, so that's the you get to look forward this to. This week. This week. Two this days from week. Uh, I should should clarify that is the Diablo 2 resurrected ladder. Yes. So I I believe Diablo 2, the original Diablo 2, still has its own ladder system. Uh, cycle that goes on and i think Does they run really? about yes i think they run about six months and uh yeah, but yes this is diablo 2 resurrected and i'm kind of i mean i'm a little bummed out by diablo 2 resurrected because the first couple of ladders they were doing like oh we're gonna add new rune words and new cool things with every with ladder resets and they haven't done that for the last couple and it's kind of like okay well diablo's a pretty old game and maybe we shouldn't expect new development on it but it kind of looked like they were doing that originally and uh now we're seeing less of that but still ladder season is a good reason to jump on and play and do that race to the top again yeah and i mean and i personally i'm still playing remastered um yeah i liken it to a comfortable pair of shoes where oh, like good point uh because i've been sort of i don't want to say disappointed but Diablo four seasons haven't been what I wanted. So I've just been kind of going yeah. back to Diablo two. <laughs> um, so I'm always excited when they do seasons or ladders or things like that, because it's just another thing to do. Comfortable, comfortable pair of shoes to put back on and take a walk. <laughs> and though that said, I actually was playing uh, Diablo one Diablo four. Oh, wow. There's so many numbers here. Diablo four season one this afternoon. And it, Diablo four can be really fun, but it's like, it kind of hits these breakpoints, like the grind up to 50 feels like it takes forever. And then once you clear that first capstone dungeon and you get into world tier three, suddenly you're getting paragon points. You're getting all of these gear upgrades. And there's this window of time where it feels really fun and exciting again because you've got all of this advancement open to you and you're getting cool new things and you've got hell tides for the first time. And at some point in there, it's going to start slowing down again and I'm probably going to be less excited. The Diablo 4 Season 1 ends on October 17th, which is not that far away. I would I would like to finish the season. I don't know if I'm going to. I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish, uh, to get through the battle pass. I don't know. I'm actually, but I'm going to try. I'm, I'm curious if you're going to be able to do it. Uh, I mean, we're going to have to ask and you're going to have to report back. Uh, I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So, yes, I will give you progress reports as I go. And then coming up also, I believe it is October 4th through the 17th. We talked about this a little bit. It's going to be the Eastern Kingdoms Cup, which I'm actually excited about. I like the uh, the Dragon Riding Cups. I think they're fun. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did you do the last one? So the last one, like, even though they extended the event, I just didn't have time to jump in there because life has been so busy. So I didn't have time to jump in and do that one. And that's part of the reason I'm looking forward to this one, because I can go in and get those transmog rewards, because WoW is just a big game of dress up. I'm in it for the transmog, and I didn't get any of it. Maybe one disappointing thing about this one is there's no new transmog to collect. So if you did the last one, this one's for funsies. There are no new rewards that I'm aware of. But if you're like me and you didn't do the first, uh, the Kalimdor Cup, you can still collect those transmogs and get your like cool flight goggles and your your you can get that dragon riding look that maybe you've always wanted. All right. And now for the news item that I think Liz and I have been dreading just a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, we're going to talk about it because it did happen today. Uh, earlier today, it was announced that uh, Chris Metzen is back at Blizzard full time not just in an advisory role, uh, but he is now the creative director of content or executive creative director, excuse me, of the Warcraft universe, uh, which is interesting on multiple levels. Um, an executive creative director is generally somebody who is in charge of a department that produces creative content, uh, which means that people like Steve Denauser and the story team will likely be under him again if he wasn't already and we'll be mm -hmm. re reporting up through them uh, and receiving their orders from them, um, which I think is is I know some people are really, really excited about this. I actually don't know how I feel quite yet about it. I like 
Metzen. Uh, I've interacted with him in the past and I haven't never had a problem with him as a person. Uh, but one of the things we've talked about on Lore Watch and here even is how the narrative of World of Warcraft has shifted from the old timers uh, and sort of like done their passing of the torch story and have shifted the scope of storytelling, um, which I think was important to the sort of like the survival and longevity of the story of the game. And they did that without Metzen. Um, with him coming back, the question is, does that continue to happen? And you have people like Steve Denauser, who I really feel has done an f- absolutely fantastic job uh, you know, directing the story and getting it to a point where it doesn't feel as patchwork as it has in the past. And there is, seems to be a cohesive creative design. There's not uh, somebody once said that there were more retcons in the first two expansions <laughs> of, of world of Warcraft than any sitcom they had ever watched on TV. Um, there hasn't been nearly as many of those. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I think Denauser and team has really spent a lot of time, not just shoring up content in the past and bringing a lot of stories to a close, like, the Silvana story, whether you loved it or hate it, uh, that's coming. That came to a close. It has a final point. It's open ended enough that they can still do stuff, but it felt complete. Um, the Night Elf storyline and everything that happened with the Night Warrior Taranda and Malfurion and and, and Ysera and everything else is coming to a close in this expansion, and it feels like it's being I don't want to say completely tied up because I don't think it ever will be, but mm-hmm. it feels cohesive. It feels like there's a a, a actual like design and and credit there and the idea is or the question is is that going to change in the future is it are we going to see more of the old wow storytelling or are they going to be allowed to do the new wow storytelling so i've talked i'm going to shut up and let liz go here see what i see what you say one of the things that i thought with metzen and a lot of the other old guard leaving was I heard a lot of doom and gloom when that was happening. Oh, it's the death of Warcraft. It's the death of Blizzard because all of these big names are walking away. But I kind of felt like, mm, no, this is a new opportunity for the company. We, This is an opportunity for people whose names we don't know for a new generation of developers and storytellers to come up within the company and tell new stories. Because Warcraft is kind of your, at its core, it's your basic... It's kind of a classic fantasy environment, and it's that's the kind of storytelling that you can tell Chris Metzen really loves. You can he is so earnest and so enthusiastic about his stories, but he really has a love for this classic fantasy genre, the big burly orcs, and you know the the classic orcs versus humans thing that's 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 Metzen. And so I'm concerned that you know, maybe this is that new opportunity for new kinds of storytelling, which we've seen in Dragonflight. We've seen such a variety of characters. We've seen so many new and interesting characters. We've seen old characters brought in in new ways, telling new stories. And it's been great. I've loved Dragonflight. I've loved all of the little diversions, the small stories, and, you know, the larger stories, like uh, getting back and trying to restore Tyr, all of the story of the dragon flights that has been building since before there was a world of Warcraft that we're now seeing come to fruition. I think dragon flight has been an amazing expansion for stories. Agreed. And now instead of, you know, looking forward, it feels like we're looking backwards. We're looking to Chris Metzen who came up with the original world of Warcraft and Warcraft stories. It feels like a step backwards and I don't want to, to bad talk Metzen. He he brought us this game that we all love. And but it feels like the game has evolved. And I don't know if Metzen plans to evolve with it. Is the new generation of storytelling going to be shoved back in a box? Are we going to have all of these cool new things that we enjoy be retconned because Metzen has a different vision about where the story is going? Are we going back to the orcs versus humans thing? Are we going to step back on all of this cool cross faction stuff we've started to do? I I just have a lot of concerns. I and I know a lot of a lot of people are really hyped about Metzen, and I'm happy for you if you were one of those people. I I it makes me anxious. I have a lot of worries about what might happen. There, and maybe 
maybe none of it will come to pass, but I don't know. And I'm worried. There's another albatross that's sort of hanging over this as well, too. Like, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Mm. Metzen was part of the old guard where a lot of really bad things happened under their watch. Uh, We've made no, you know, short talk about it we've we've talked about it at at length uh we all have very strong opinions of it everybody was affected by everything that came out in in with the sexual harassment suits and the discrimination suits and and everything else that occurred um metzen not that he was ever implicated in any of that uh but even in 2021 he said outright that him and other people in leadership failed too many people when they needed them because they had a privilege of not noticing, not engaging and not creating necessary space for the colleagues who needed them as leaders. That's an exact quote from him, by the way. And so I start to wonder, like, is, is that too much of a baggage? Is that going to be something that carries with him taking over that position? And I know he's, he's beloved by a lot of people, but I can't help but feel like is that, is that okay for him to come back now, even after all of that has blizzard fully recovered from it. And it's with a bunch of other stumbles that have been happening too. Right. Mm -hmm. Like overwatch Two pulling the plug on the co-op play, uh, the, the co-op story mode play, uh, as a standalone unit, uh, finding out from the creative director of, or I think it was the creative director of, uh, overwatch Two that overwatch was always meant to be sort of the, um, Overwatch was supposed to be turned into the original vision of the original Project Titan MMO that we never got. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that got pulled way back when. Um, so players feel really strongly about that. Uh, Diablo 4 is still trying to find its stride. It's not failing by any sense of the word, at least not that I've noticed or can really tell. Uh, but like seasons are struggling to find like a stride and find its own identity a little bit. We've talked about that a bunch as well. Um, and then this, so I'm, I'm really hope that it's for the better. I hope that he can adapt and catch up with how things are going. I hope that we're not going to see too many recons. And I hope that he's more sensitive or knowledgeable of what happened in the past and in his new role, uh, or new old role, right? Cause this is essentially what he did before he was the yeah. VP of creative, um, doesn't let that happen again. So, I, but I don't know where it's going to go. I think it's going to be real interesting to see where things happen, especially the announcement timing is very intriguing as well from a, a expansion standpoint, because mm-hmm. essentially Dragonflight is starting to bring its cooldown cycle. Even if we have mm-hmm. another, another set of content after the one that's going to be releasing with the next tier, it's sort of in that in-between phase. We have BlizzCon coming up as well uh, really, really soon, where I'm confident they're going to announce another expansion. Probably will be Metzen announcing it, if anything. Um, yeah. And then talking about where the story is going to go from there. So it's an interesting time. Probably makes sense from that perspective, but I don't know. I'm hoping it'll be good and not bad. I I I have hope, but I have concerns. Uh, I mean, and I think people are going to be watching. I think I think people are going to be watching. People are certainly going to be watching. I mean, Metzen Metzen brings a lot of excitement with him. But whenever I see Metzen's name, I think of that time he went up on the BlizzCon stage and explained that Warlords of Draenor was a boys' trip, and that was why there were no women involved in it. And that was just such a disappointing moment that even all of these years later, that's the first thing I think of when I think of Chris Metzen, because I remember being in the crowd when he said that and just kind of the, crestfallen, the, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, this, this, I'm not actually being invited to play in your boys club. And, uh, yeah, and, and I mean, so- and let's be honest, in the year of, in the year of our YOG 2023, um, <laughs> There are like like, if we don't acknowledge that there are women who play this game and other Mm -hmm. Blizzard games, uh, that's a problem. So and that wasn't that long ago. World of Draenor was like how many years ago at this point? Uh, Too long ago and too recently, both Uh, 2014. So almost 10 years ago. But ten years is not that long. (laughs) Like Mm. like a decade sounds like a long time, but it's really it's really not. So hopefully we don't get any more boys trips. Hopefully we get more characters because like I'll even say this: some of the best storytelling I think has happened in a while has been the Tron Night Warrior stuff. Feeling her pressure Mm -hmm. as a leader and everything that that happened around that. Having Chandra's Feather Moon 
uh, take her role and, and sort of the struggle that she had within there. Even the Sylvana stuff, whether you loved it or hated it, was powerful. It made you feel a specific way, and it definitely put her in a limelight. It put her in a spotlight that the character had never really been in before. Um, you have all, you Sarah, you have all these strong female characters that exist, and I would hate to see them be pushed to the side. Uh, you know, first Arcanist, uh, Thalysra is an absolutely amazing character and she is absolutely the, uh, the, where's the pants in that relationship with, uh, <laughs> with her husband. So like, I need to see her go away completely. And, and I don't know it again, not to put too much or dwell on it too much. We're going to be watching. I know that Metzen is capable of great storytelling and coming up with some great ideas. And I hope that he listens to the team that's been doing it under, their own stewardship in his stead for the last seven years. Cause it has been seven years since he, he was in this role. So, cause he left in 2016. Oh my gosh. It's, it's been so long. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that long, but it has been <sighs> just a blizzard has a long history of kind of pushing female characters out of the way. And I think part of this is you've got, a bunch of different people on the writing team and in the creative team that are pushing in their own little directions. And that can get, that can get complicated for a game that's almost 20 years old. Well, that's just world of Warcraft. That's almost 20 years old. Warcraft as a story, as a property is even older. So, I mean, it's hard to keep something current and keep everything going in the same narrative direction when you have that much history. But I, there is, there is a pretty long history in the Warcraft narrative of, you know, kind of sidelining the, uh, the female characters. Uh, Most Agra recently, disappeared. Agra disappeared for how long? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had to have that boys trip. You remember that? Like, so I, I, I hope that Metzen has learned things from all of this from, from everything that happened following Warlords of Draenor. And I do think the end product of Warlords of Draenor was maybe less of a boys trip than it was initially advertised as. I think the game changed as a result of all the feedback they got from that. But uh, I, I got my concerns and we'll just see. I, I hope Metzen is on board for kind of a new era of WoW storytelling because it's been a long time since Warcraft 1 Orcs and Humans. And we, we need to move on to new kinds of storytelling. Now, if the idea is that the new storytelling ties up to maybe some other loose ends, like maybe some old gaudy stuff that has been kind of hanging in the wind for a while that Matt may, and I may or may not have talked about in our most recent lore watch, <laughs> and you should probably listen to it. Uh, like that stuff I'm okay with, like if we're, if we're tying up some loose ends. But yeah, I think, I think we need to continue to evolve the storytelling. Uh, but I think that's it for news items. I don't think there's anything else outstanding. Can you think of anything that we've missed, Liz? Uh, no, I think we've covered it. All right. Well, then I think it is time for one of the most wonderful things of the week, which is answering your questions. Friends, if you have questions for this or any of our podcasts, be sure to send those into podcast at blizzardwatch.com, singular podcast. Uh, include what show it is for in the subject line, if you can, please. Uh, and also specify if there is a special way to say your name or pronounce it so that uh, it, Matt and I don't stumble over it because we absolutely <laughs> will. It, it happens right razor berg i mean bug uh, <laughs> uh if you, you don't want to hit us up on email you can hit us up on discord we have uh, a, a channel for everyone which is the patron or sorry it's the q and podcast questions channel everyone is welcome to post there if you are a patreon supporter you can hit us up on the patreon q and podcast questions channel we tend to look there first as a way of saying thank you to our patreon supporters for helping us keep the lights on and make sure that shows like this and all the other ones we do continue to happen uh again specify what show it's for and, you know, let us know any pronunciations. All right. So our first one comes from Ken. I know how to pronounce that one. That one's easy. No good. <laughs> uh, there are two questions here. Uh, one, what will happen if Microsoft's plan to acquire Activision Blizzard is approved in the U.S., but not the U.K.? As far as I know, the deal is then approved in the whole world, except in the U.K. Will the deal then go through, and what will that mean for the U.K.? Will Activision Blizzard games not be available in the U.K., or can they just not have any offices there? Um, so distribution and office space are two completely different things. Uh, and also, if they don't approve of the acquisition... I don't know what it actually means for the UK because it used to be part of the European Union and it followed a very strict regimental ruling 
for what was allowed to be uh, displayed there, what was be able to be sold there, uh, what products were allowed in, and like you pointed out, offices as well. I think that is probably the most likely one, maybe. But I'm gonna I'll though, let this go. Though it this past week, or maybe it was the week before, it actually looks like the UK may have come to a deal with Microsoft over over Activision, the Activision Blizzard acquisition, and it looks like it's going to go ahead. Uh, and it may be going ahead on a timeline where we will see Microsoft execs up on stage at BlizzCon. I don't know, but it does look like they're 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 in the process of clearing that hurdle. I am very interested to see what happens after that. This is one of the things that I've been excited and nervous about since they announced it, which is the the acquisition of uh, Activision Blizzard by Microsoft, because I'm very curious to see how things shake out afterwards. There's been predictions galore, uh, but I'm curious what it's going to mean for involvement with the Microsoft platform, what it's going to mean for content that is included on things like Game Pass, if any. Um, I, I'm really curious, and maybe it will get done. Maybe we will see them up on on the stage at, at BlizzCon. Uh, and if not, certainly in the next game stuff, which I think happens in February, March, which is the next like big game events. So we'll see. I mean, but we we do know Blizzard likes to hold on to stuff for BlizzCon. So I'm sure they would be super excited if they could have a, announcements ready for BlizzCon. But we're getting we're getting a pretty close to BlizzCon at this point. Real dang close. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. It's I, oh, we're what, five weeks away, six weeks it's just uh, yeah. around the corner. It's it's crazy season over here for us with BlizzCon right on the horizon. All right. And then there's the second question here from Ken, which is about Hearthstone and Unity. <laughs> uh, to my knowledge, Hearthstone is created in the Unity game engine. With the recent Unity policy changes, do you think Blizzard might create their own engine for the game? Hearthstone has gotten very big and complex over the years, so a custom engine made from scratch and built specifically for this game will probably benefit. What do you think? Um, probably not. It'll probably never change off of Unity uh, unless they decide to do Hearthstone 2.0 and and develop their own tools. Here's the reality of it. Well, first, Unity CEO backed off of it and issued an apology. Uh, John Ricciello, uh, which is now teasing a a cap or talking about having a cap based off of it instead of having the per user fee. Because let's be honest, the per user fee thing or the per installation fee that they were talking about. Uh, was never something that they were going to be able to get accurate numbers on. And now they're going to be relying on financial reporting from the people who are using Unity to develop their games as opposed to anything proprietary. Because again, we knew that they weren't going to be able to do anything with that that didn't violate a million agreements. So they've walked mm-hmm. back a bunch of that. Um, but the and runti- one, one big thing about the new Unity policy that they've announced is that it will only apply to the next version of Unity, which is shipping next year, when previously it was going to be like, this is going to apply to all Unity games, everything developed in Unity uh, starting in the new year, which was causing a lot of problems for games, like uh, famously Cult of the Lamb said mm-hmm. the game is just not going to sell the game anymore with the new licensing scheme, that it was going to come off of stores, because after, in 2024, they would be charged for each installation of the game. And uh, that's pretty drastic. So I'm I'm not surprised to see that they finally backed down on that. So well, at least games bit. that have, a little bit, at least games that have already been developed don't have to take just such drastic measures and pull themselves off the shelves. And I mean, I think Hearthstone's going to be the same. It can't, they're not just going to go and redevelop the game. Another thing is we are hearing rumors of layoffs in the Hearthstone team. We already have a couple of confirmations of people who were previously on the Hearthstone team who are now no longer employed by Blizzard Entertainment. And, you know, I'm not sure what's going on there. Are they shrinking the team? Are they dialing back on Hearthstone development? Hearthstone has had... mm, I mean, the game is doing well, to the best of my knowledge, but they've also had some uh, some missteps, like the mercenaries mode that went out, that was, they put a lot of time and effort into developing that, hyping it up, and they kept it out for a while, and then they sunsetted it. Yeah, and and that's an interesting thing to keep in mind when we talk about this, and also the extreme undertaking that creating a separate engine would be. 
So Mm -hmm. you're, and I talked about this a a, a long time ago. There used to be a very separate philosophy of game design in the East versus the West. And if you're looking at it from the the point of view of sitting here, like we are in the States where Mm -hmm. Western developers tended to license an engine, use the engine until they couldn't anymore. And then move on to another engine where creating the engine itself was its own separate thing. Years ago, uh, more like Eastern uh, based companies, would try to create their own engine. Famously, Final Fantasy was notorious for this. Every time a new Final Fantasy released, it would release on a brand new engine that they created from scratch. The problem with that is it increases your dev time on the game, increases your cost. Uh, while it does give you maybe a set of tools that are great for that specific game, if you're not going to then use it and move forward with another game set in that, Mm -hmm. Uh, Using that system, you've now wasted that development time and money. And sometimes some of those games have been famously bad as a result of it with uh, lacking some of the polish or um, mechanic wise being weak or story wise being weak because sacrifices had to be made to push development for an engine. It is infinitely easier to use an existing engine and the tools that come with it, especially something like Unity. So Unity is very ubiquitous when it comes to game development because it has a million plugins. A lot of different things have been developed for it. You can go on Humble Bundle right now at the time of this recording, and there's two audio bundles that are all about uh, ambient music and sound effects and everything else. And it's not a standalone thing. It's nothing for like used for streaming or things like that, where you, you, or though you could. It's Unity plugins. It's all Unity plugins for whatever you're doing in Unity. Um, and we talked about this a little bit last week. Unity is used in everything, not just from games, but health software, uh, data collection software, parsing data software. Like there's a million applications for it across the board where it's used. So using something that one has a dedicated development team that you can lean on if something goes wrong or you can't get something in particular to work Two has a plethora of options available to you because of all of the plugins that are available to it or the length of time that it's been available in development uh, for all these individual things that have, people have made for it. Uh, and three, just the wealth of knowledge that's available for it as well makes it easy and also helps you keep your development cost down. Now, with everything that's happening with Hearthstone, we don't know what the future of Hearthstone is. It could be moving into a maintenance mode. It could be moving into it where everything is going to be sort of like that that small-ish cycle. We have no idea. Um, but I don't think it would ever be a good idea for them now to try to take everything they've tried to shoehorn into uh, Hearthstone and try to port it to a brand new game uh, game engine. I think it would be absolutely disastrously uh, and, and would be a huge money sink. So yeah, my personal opinion. I mean, on them. we have certainly seen games that switched engines. Uh, the one I know of famously was Mass Effect Andromeda, which EA pushed to be developed in their new Frostbite engine. And uh, the Bioware team had never worked in Frostbite before. Mm -hmm. Frostbite wasn't really designed for games like a Mass Effect game. It was much more of a first-person shooter engine. And it meant the Mass Effect team had to build all of these tools to try and make this engine fit their game. It meant the ended, you know, Andromeda didn't get a great reception on release. It It was a little rough on launch day. And it feels a lot more like a first-person shooter than other Mass Effect games because it was built in that engine. And switching engines on a game is not a small thing. It, it would just be a huge development hurdle, even if they switch to some to another, you know, known engine that's already been developed. That's just it's such a big deal. I I don't think it's going to happen, no matter what Unity does. Yeah. And I mean, even when they did uh, the original World of Warcraft, and this is an interesting tidbit, and I don't know if they've talked about this before, the original World of Warcraft got its starts based in the Warcraft 3 engine. So Hmm. uh, they built it as a third party like RPG map where you got to experience the world at the time it was Kalimdor, uh, specifically Kalimdor. Uh, as one of the hero classes originally that was the proof of concept and i remember finding it and and because players could access it it was one of those things that they before world of warcraft was ever announced they put it out there uh and it got such a huge reception that they kind of continued to use that as uh, impetus to push forward but they never could build what world of warcraft is now in that current engine and so Mm -hmm. they 
did their own thing. And I can't remember what tools it's based off of or, or set on. Um, but there are limitations that when you got butt up against it, you move on or look for something else. But once you're established in something, you tend not to try to move past it or, or, or beyond it unless you don't have any other choice. Um, yeah. So hopefully that answers your question, but I think we're going to move on to a next one. Uh, since we are rapidly running out of time here, uh, this one comes from Tetsemi, which I think is relevant to earlier parts of our conversation. Which Ooh. rebooting or 2.0ing of an online game had the worst reception? And was it made worse by the decision to leave the original running or shutting it down? My nostalgic rose-colored glasses would argue Star Wars Galaxies, but my recency bias says Overwatch. What do you think, Liz? Ooh. I I really think Overwatch is a standout here because there was so much miscommunication about it. I think if we saw an Overwatch 2 that was as it was originally described with this robust story mode and RPG style advancement, we'd have a whole different we'd be having whole different conversations about Overwatch today than we are now. But instead, it felt like Overwatch 2 was, okay, here's Overwatch, but now with a battle pass system and more monetization. It's, that's a hard sell. That's a hard sell when you say, hey, we're going to make it so you can't play the old game anymore, but you got to pay us more money to play the new game, even though you paid for a boxed version of the original game. (sighs) It's just, Overwatch 2 has had a rough time because, and I think a lot of that was communication because they did. It, they sold us on something that was not what they delivered at all. Yeah. Um, there are a couple that really stand out to me that are probably going to be weird deep cuts. Uh, okay. That, uh, Let's do it. <laughs> Golden Axe. Did you know that it got a reboot in 2008 from its arcade classic style to a uh, 3D action adventure game? What? Yeah. What? So back during in 2008, because adventure games were 3D adventure games were sort of becoming like the thing um, mm-hmm. with the success of a lot of other titles at the time. Sega decided, why don't we just do this with Golden Axe? And it was absolutely horrible. Um, the graphics were bad. The gameplay was weird. The control system didn't make any sense because you were essentially trying to take a beat em up and turn the beat em up into an action adventure game. Um, but I remember mm. that being absolutely awful. Um, another weird deep cut, and I wish Matt was here for this one because I can hear him <laughs> cackling as I'm about to mention this. Do you remember the game back in the olden days for the Nintendo called Bionic Commando? I do not. So it was a game in which you were essentially a a Marine or commando that had a robotic arm as a replacement and you had to go and fight for liberty and freedom. This is 1987, by the way. Uh, Okay. 2009 came calling and, uh, well, 2009 said, what if we made this a 3D action adventure game? You notice a trend here. <laughs> mm. uh, the game was really poorly done, uh, didn't really do well, um, and just like was absolutely just awful. Um, you have other ones that like there was a, a Slaughterhouse reboot as well that didn't do very, very well. There was a street uh, or final fight. Streetwise, which is another beat 'em up, they, they tried to turn into like a 3D fighting game, which didn't work. They wanted to be like virtual fighter, uh, that just didn't work. There was a Mortal Kombat that released in 2010, 2011, that just flopped. Like it just didn't do well at all. And then they re re can like took themselves back and said, "Here we go. Here's we're gonna try this again." Uh, and then hit gold the next time. There's been a bunch of them and there's been good ones too. Like there's been good reboots that worked like, uh, what is it? The Wolfenstein series got a nice little reboot. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, there, you know, modern Wolfenstein is different from classic Wolfenstein, but it's still good. Very much so. Um, and then I think for every Wolfenstein, there's a Turok, the dinosaur hunter <laughs> that gets a reboot in 2008 as a, well, 3d action adventure game. Uh, huh. yeah. Or the, uh, the what is it, Sonic the Hedgehog 2006? Now, these are not mm. online games, because online games generally don't have a whole lot of, of 2.0 uh, remixes once they're, once they're released. It's very rare. Um, ones that stand out as good ones, Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV went through a rebirth process, which is why it's called Realm Reborn. Its initial release was bad. Absolutely awful. 
um, was not playable, was very, very grindy, turned off a lot of players. They went back, listened to feedback, and re-released it as The Realm Reborn, and it's been a wild success for them, uh, the, which is a relatively small development team for an MMO with a relatively small budget compared to the rest of the, the uh, IP stuff that Sony does, but they did a fantastic job with it, uh, and it rebooted and gave it new life. It's fantastic. Um, and it's also one of those games where I understand where we talk about Blizzard stuff here, but give it a try if you ever want to see like the new MMO and what a, a good reimagining or a good 2.0 kickoff can look like. Um, but yeah, like those are some deep cuts, but hopefully I can't think of anything more. Are there any other games that, that you can think of that rebooted or had like a, a 2.0 in? I, I think you, you gotta bring up the one that Matt would bring up. <laughs> Which, which is Cyberpunk 2077, yeah. which has just had its big expansion release, has just had its literal 2.0 patch, which completely redid the talent system, removed armor as a stat from the game, so you so can just, good. if you want to look cool, you just wear whatever cool stuff you find, and your stats are tied to other stuff, cyberware. And... This was a game that came out with a real bad release. This had a, such a rough release that, you know, it was famously removed from the Sony PlayStation Store for like six months because it was so buggy. But it has brought the thing all the way around with a just adding brand new systems in this patch. And uh, what looks to be a really killer expansion story with Idris Elba and it's like this this it looks like this is going I, very hard and I am so excited to play it. Yeah, it's one of those things where um I may or may not have accidentally spent the last well 15 hours playing the game. Um <laughs> yeah, accidentally. Okay, okay. We're, we are going to talk about it at some point and it's going to mm -hmm. be really hard like to get me to shut up about it because I'm absolutely in love with this expansion for, for cyberpunk. And that is a really good example. Like it's another, it's another game that went through the quote unquote development hell released to a Rocky start mm -hmm. had bugs galore. Uh, you know, was the most botched game release we've seen in ages and then yeah. had its rebirth and had this sort of second coming. Uh, the other one that I can really think of that fits that as well is no man's sky. Oh which, yes, that's very true. Which is another online game, essentially, uh, where it released, and it wasn't necessarily that it was absolutely awful. It just couldn't deliver on everything it had promised prior mm -hmm. in development mm -hmm. because it was such a small development studio, like a group of people, like too many small developers doing it. Uh, Hello Games, I think, was like four people, one person, and then like a couple people helping him. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's expanded and they've they made good on all their promises and ha has had a rebirth. As a matter of fact, it's held up as sort of like the standard now for space games. Like when you hear people talk about uh, why can't I think of the new Bethesda game that just released Starfield? <laughs> yes, Starfield. Yeah, sorry. That game, that, that huge, game. the hugest RPG to come out this year. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. There's, there's competition there. A lot of but, competition there. It's, but it's also really mixed because and the people that are loving criticism against it are mm -hmm. almost always using uh, No Man's Sky as sort of like the comparison stick. And so like the things that they note as negatives in, uh, you know, Starfield are things that No Man's Sky does. And it's interesting to see like a game that went through a very rocky initial release is being held up as a standard for games that are now being released currently. So there's there's good 2.0 releases and, and and bumps out there as well. So not all of them are bad. Overwatch 2 was definitely probably the worst of the most mm. recent ones. But I think that's it. I think we are currently out of time. Unless there's anything else you want to add, Liz. I think that's about it. Well then, friends, Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions of Patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means that this podcast signing community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, a better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue in an ads reset experience. Again, if you have questions for this podcast or any of our podcasts, be sure to send those into podcast at blizzardwatch.com. Specify what show it's for, as well as any special pronunciations of your name. If you want to hit us up on Discord, you can hit us up on our Q and podcast questions channel. Or if you are a Patreon supporter, uh, again, thank you very much for helping us keep the lights on. You can send those into the Patreon Q and Podcast Questions channel. Specify the show it's for and your pronunciations. But with that, folks, 
We'll see you next week. <laughs>